So what I'm going to talk about real quick is I'm going to talk about um, security ratings, but effectively, I want to do a uh, some deep dives into, well, not deep dives, but at least looking at some ransomware um, incidents that have happened. So I want to sort of dig into that a little bit. But let's start out. Obviously, you need to know who I am. Why am I speaking to you in the first place? I've been doing cybersecurity for over 35 years. I can't believe I get to say that nowadays. So I'm an old guy. Um, and I've done everything from being a programmer, uh, writing assembly code to COBOL to whatever it happened to be back in the intelligence community in the DOD. Uh, started my own business, built it, sold it, screwed off for a couple of years in the wine industry. So I'm really more of a wine guy than a bourbon than a gym person, but you know, a little liquor that I don't like yet. So, um, but then finally I find myself here uh, at BitSight and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do as we go through. But um, what I really want to do is talk about what's current today. And first off, just before I continue, um, Mark or Donna, can you tell me, are you seeing the NSA slide right now? Yes. Okay, good. I was a, I'm worried about, a little worried about Zoom, that's all. So, so um, as most of you know, um, the NSA just released this uh, bulletin, which has 23 different vulnerabilities that everyone should look out for because they're basically being, um, that's basically targeted by ransomware and other types of threat actors, right? Um, and I want to talk specifically about ransomware because it's really hot for a lot of reasons, uh, and I'll go into that. Um, but let me just jump through hoops a little bit here. But first off, um, when I think about ransomware, typically, and when I was at IBM's X Force, we thought about it as a phishing exercise, and then somebody would ask for you know a half a Bitcoin, or and you can get your data back, and blah blah blah. But nowadays, in the last year or two, um, we're starting to see more uh, real enterprise ransomware is what I would call it. So anything, so they, they'll actually spend time to target organizations and demand ransom any, ransoms anywhere from a half million to I think 10 million. Security thing, I don't know. No. So um, and if you all could mute yourself, there you go, thank you. Um, it's to, to anywhere to about $10 million. And Coveware, uh, who I only heard about recently, by the way, did a study and they came up and said that um, RDP is, uh, is taking, um, is actually surpassed email phishing in terms of ransomware attack vectors. And then if you can contrast that to kind of the left-hand side, which is um, being able to see if some, an organization would be a victim of ransomware particularly the targeted ransomware that isn't just about phishing. It's actually about attacking those CVEs, which we talked about. And I'll jump into that here a little bit in a second and, and talk about some of the details. Um, the interesting thing is that what we do at BitSight is we actually profile organizations from the outside um, to give them a security rating. But we also uh, pick up on things like open ports, uh, botnet infections, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm not here to sell you BitSight. I'm here to sort of talk about some interesting technical things that you can do. Um, but right out of the gate, um, just by looking at organizations from the outside, without doing anything that is invasive, um, we actually can pick up on eight out of those 23 uh, CVEs that were in that NSA uh, warning. And we keep, we're evaluating other ones, um, and I'll tell you why and how we actually do that. So what we do here is we'll do stuff like um, we pick up on events. And we'll do that through looking at organizations. So we footprint organizations and we find out all the domains and IP addresses that you own, that any organization owns. And then we'll, we run botnet sinkholes, we run uh, honeypots, we have, we pick up on um, backscatter uh, data in effectively dark nets, which means there's, nobody should be doing anything there. We pick up all that stuff and we say, oh, wow, this organization is infected with uh, Gamma Roo or whatever, you know, pick a botnet or ransomware infection. Um, we also look for, for uh, outbound traffic that's indicative of port scanning, uh, spam, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also look at botnet infection or, uh, excuse me, BitTorrent uh, activity and things like that. On the other side, we do things like look for open ports, we look for um, uh, patching, we look at email security, whether web applications have the appropriate uh, security headers, all, all kinds of different things like that. Um, and we drive a lot of those from different means, but it's all from the outside, right? And so what we do is we break all those down into what we call risk vectors and they have letter grades, so 23 of them. 
Um, and then ultimately we take those things and we percolate them up to an overall, what, what we call a security rating or a headline rating sometimes. And we track our organizations and the reason for doing that is to be able to, um, you know, if you're looking at third parties and you, or maybe an acquisition target, you can look at them and see how well from the outside they're performing, which is a good indication of their internal hygiene as well. Um, and you can look at the history and um, we also profile the footprint and sort of look at an organization from a uh, hierarchical tree perspective. So, so all that said, um, one of the really interesting things that we do is that we pick up on different vulnerabilities from the outside. And just so you, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, that's, you know, how much can you pick up from the outside? But we did a study a couple of years ago and we're redoing it now where um, from our perspective, our rating uh, methodology is 250 to 900, pretty much like the consumer credit score rating here in the uh, US. Um, and so if an organization has a 700 or above as a baseline, then as they drop by 100 point increments, they're incrementally more likely to be breached. So in other words, if you have a six to 700 ratings, uh, rating, then you're twice as likely to be breached, et cetera. Um, and then another thing is that if you've got any botnet uh, infections, and by that I mean true botnets, things that reach out to a command and control servers and they can download plugins and steal banking credentials and do whatever, there's a really good chance that the attacker has a point of presence inside your network. And as a consequence of that, you're twice as likely to be breached because obviously the attacker can move east-west and sort of find your crown jewels and steal them. Um, if we see BitTorrent information from an organization, that also uh, is quite, that organization is twice as likely to be breached. And if their open ports grade is F. And then the third thing is, if we see 50% of the computers are running outdated operating systems, they're three times likely to be breached. So don't believe us, um, AIR Worldwide, who's a catastrophic modeling agency, did an independent study using our ratings, but their data, and they came up with similar results, right? So effectively, you know, 0.6% um, likely to be breached if you're 700 or above, 1.1% 1. Uh, 1 if you're 6 to 700, 237 So basically, um, it's important because it means that even looking at organizations from the outside, we can uh, determine whether or not there's a likelihood of breach. So here's the meat of it. Uh, so let's go through a few examples here of organizations. And we have uh, redacted the names to protect the, uh, the folks who have already been victims of ransomware. So no need, no need to name and shame them. Um, but so let's go through some of these. So one of them is an IT staffing and servants, servants, service uh, uh, organization that was hit by ransomware, pretty hard, by the way. Um, so interestingly, if you look at what we, BitSight, figured out beforehand is that, remember that correlation to breach study. Um, so if they're in the four to 500 range, they're three times more likely to be breached. And in fact, if you, if you look at this graph, if you look at the bottom right-hand side, I hope you can see this on your screen, there's a little uh, exclamation point. And that's when they actually were hit by ransomware. And so um, you can see that their rating was doing pretty well. It was 600, it was kind of cruising along. There were a couple, where these little uh, numbers are, it means that they've had some change in their security posture. Um, and so they had a few little incidents here and there. Not not instance like somebody breached them, but you know an open port was discovered or maybe a botnet infection or whatever. But then as you can see, starting around um, March, presumably when everybody went to work from home, there was this precipitous series of events that really dropped them from almost a 700. They were getting pretty close to um, having a good score, to be honest with you. Um, and they dropped way down. And so there are pretty good indications that something was going to happen. Right, so some breach of some sort, and sure enough, in uh, July um, they were hit by ransomware. So um, the other way to look at this, by the way, is did they have any botnet infections and potentially exploited? In our terminology, is basically potentially unwanted uh, applications, so adware and spyware. So if I looked at the trend, what you're seeing is that July, August, September, October, November, 2019, they had a couple incidents here and there. You know, nothing big. By the way, potentially on guest networks, right? So um, we don't know if this organization broke out their guest networks from their corporate network, but or at least the visibility that we get. But then you can see in March, all of a sudden there were um, at least uh, in April there were ten botnet infections. 
In uh, May, there were somewhere around seven or eight botnet infections. And the size of the bubble indicates the duration of the infection. In other words, how long it took them to detect and clean it up. But you can see the trend there. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to look at that and go, wow, they got they had spam all of a sudden. Uh, they were generating spam. They had a bunch of AdWare and spyware. They had botnet infections. Um, so really, it's a bad consequence. And then July, they get hit by that ransomware. So the point here is that there are indications, even from the outside, that an organization is going to get breached. So let's look at another one. Um, and by the way, this one uh, that I just showed you, because there's a lot of endpoint uh, observations, there's a really good chance that that was a phishing born piece of ransomware. So let's look at another piece. So this one's through an unpatched VPN. So again, we're going to protect the names. And in the news, it basically said that there's the thesis is that they were hit by um, CVE 2019-11510 or CVE 2019-19781. There's a typo in the, in the uh, article, but it is 19781. And those are the Pulse Secure um, VPN vulnerability, which appeared in the uh, NSA warning the bulletin. And 19781 is the Citrix ADC um, vulnerability, also in the NSA warning. So that's what was reported in the news. And if we start to dig in a little bit, right? So before the actual compromise, if you look at the top um, where it says vulnerability catalog, we've got this CVE 2019, 19781. Um, there are 306 organizations uh, in my particular portfolio that I'm monitoring who uh, have been, who are vulnerable to it. And then as I start to dig in, I actually see that the organization that we're looking at right now was vulnerable to it in advance of the ransomware attack. Not only that, but they actually didn't do a very good job on um, the a few of their servers, but the one in particular here actually allows TLS, uh, TLS 1.1, TLS 1.0, and SSL v3. So they don't have very good hygiene to begin with. So from the outside, it was pretty clear that they're vulnerable to the Citrix ADC vulnerability. They're not really keeping up on you know, current uh, configuration standards um, for encryption. And as a consequence, not surprised they get hit by ransomware. Another one, uh, a big hospital chain was hit. And interestingly, um, if you look at their rating, they were skating somewhere around the 710 uh, area. And they actually kind of went up a little bit. Um, so they were actually below 700 and they hit 700 as a high, 710 as a high, excuse me. And then right around uh, before the ransomware attack, they dropped to a 650. And um, so that made them twice as likely to be breached. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. And then when you sort of dig in a little bit more, what we see is that they have been vulnerable to a module in IS um, on Windows 7. And so they're not doing great in terms of keeping up on, their, uh, on the currency of their, of their web servers. And you can also see that in terms of the grades that for SSL configuration and just overall, they had a big jump in July on their, what we call bad observations. So things like, uh, you know, exposing open ports, um, having poor, um, poor, poor uh, encryption strength that's less than 2048 bits, et cetera, et cetera. So in advance, uh, this is sort of what we think happened. So there's two guesses. Number one is, uh, my primary guess is that they, one of their servers that were exposed to the internet was compromised, and then the threat actors lurked on that. And then when somebody logged in with admin account, they basically snarfed those up and then used them to gain access through a VPN server or something like that. So, you know, there's a little bit of detective, detective work in here. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Ah. Um, my second guess is that, again, if you look at uh, prior, uh, similar to the, the previous example that I showed. Again, they had four botnet infections, they had eight potentially exploited, but the trend shows that they haven't been doing a great job, but they had a little bit of spike in June just before they actually had the, um, the ransomware infection. The other thing to note is that they had uh, a lot of um, uh, Windows and Mac OS, uh, Windows that were out of date, uh, at least the browsers, and they had one old Chrome version on Mac OS X. So it's possible, although it's kind of my second guess, that they were compromised through some sort of phishing attack or maybe some sort of uh, watering hole or something that compromised the browsers. 
But the point is that they all the signals are there that this organization has not been taking care of their hygiene. So let's talk a little bit about Ryuk, um, because Ryuk is one of the ransomware families that's uh, that the NSA bulletin was talking about. And so here's this IT giant in Europe um, who was hit with ransomware, obviously Ryuk, and they were a 590 in advance of the uh, of the attack. And so kind of interestingly, that made them, as we can see, three times likely to be breached. So there's some indication. But when you dig in a little bit farther, they were vulnerable beforehand to both CVE 2019-1781 uh, and 11.5.10, so Secure Pulse and uh, the Citrix ADC vulnerabilities, which uh, I don't think there were one and two on the NSA bulletin. I could be wrong. But they definitely were in the coveware um, uh, analysis. So those two things were present. So those indications uh, were there. But then look at this mess. They had 22 botnet infections, 48 uh, browser adware and spyware infections. They were generating spam. We had 28 events that we picked up. Unsolicited communications means that there was support scanning activity coming out of their, um, their network. So all of that is just a total mess, right? So it's a chronic pattern of endpoint compromise. Um, they have poor hygiene. And when we dug into the families, we found that they were, they were a whole bunch, but the three that sort of come in, uh, stood out to me as Emotet, which one that's sort of an indicator um, of ransomware, uh, a potential ransomware um, eventual infection, right? So Emotet sort of uh, pre precedes um, another attack by ransomware. Crossrider, which is pretty, um, pretty prevalent, but still. And then Configure. So a lot of people say, well, so what, They're, they got Configure. It's pretty much neutered at this point. But here's the point. If you get hit by Configure at this point in time, you are doing something wrong. You have the wrong endpoint detection and response uh, um, software. It's just not picking up on old 10 year old uh, uh, viruses effectively, or your users are just clicking willy nilly. So one way or the other, when I see Configure, that is a horrible outcome. That means something's gone drastically wrong. So it's not that it's, it's a minor piece of malware. It's just that it should never, should never infect anybody anymore. Um, another thing is, so I look at their open ports, for example, and one thing that I see, and remember, RDP is one of those uh, targeted uh, attack vectors. They actually have RDP, if you look at the third or fourth line down um, uh, in the top left graphic. And then you can see, because one of the things we do is we, we actually do a screen grab when we see RDP or VNC or anything like that. And I, I masked out the usernames, but there are usernames on there. Um, and they never renamed their administrator. So that's interesting too, right? So they've got RDP on Windows Server 212 exposed to the internet, just a really bad thing to do. And then also um, the patching. So the vulnerability, vulnerability management performance, the bottom graphic shows that they had 134 vulnerabilities across their footprint, um, some of which had not been patched in 101 weeks, so almost two years. So they've had some vulnerabilities that have been sitting around for uh, almost two years. So they were right for, for, uh, for getting hit. And so this last one's kind of interesting, right? So it's basically a customer whose data was exposed on a public website, so it's not ransomware. Um, and oops, I was supposed to, so let's move quickly past that. So one of the interesting things is that um, we found that almost 40% of their web applications have some sort of issue. So things like um, their web application headers, no, none, no security in the web application headers, just you know, send people to their websites, which by the way, since this is, uh, it's actually a financial firm. So you could be, your account could be compromised online. Your broker uh, login portal might be out there, who knows? Um, so there were no security headers. And then if you look at the third one down, which is HTTPS redirect to HTTP, that means if you went to acme.com and then it redirected you to HTTP acme.com and then redirected you to acme portfolio management.com or whatever, right? So basically you went to an HTTPS site, it redirected you to a clear text HTTP site and then back to an HTTPS site. So the problem with that is that if you go to that clear text site, that's where a man in the middle can attack and happen. And somebody can steal session cookies, session IDs, whatever, right? So there are things that are exposed in the headers that can be stolen during this sort of horrible redirect. 
So the reality is if you go to an HTTPS site, they can still redirect from there. They just should redirect to another HTTPS site. So not a really good thing. And we find that, again, almost 40% of their, ah, I keep reading to redact that, damn it. So the other thing that we saw with them is that they're running on unsupported server versions. So for example, um, we see that they were on Apache 227. And that, if you look at the little arrow, points down to a login page. And if I'm not mistaken, was that a, uh, no, that was, I don't know what that was. I couldn't figure out what exactly that login page was, but they're running something on a really old piece of uh, software, right? Apache 227. When we look at uh, Microsoft IIS 7.5, it's used for two things. One of them, the sort of middle one is, it says forbidden access is denied, which implies that there's some log on or some credentials that are supposed to be there. So, um, and that sort of supposes there's something important behind it. But then if you look at this one on the left bottom, that actually is a broker portal um, running on an old uh, system. So imagine your broker has got access to uh, many accounts. So running it on IIS 7.5 is just a really bad thing to do. So not absolutely, um, not a real big surprise that they were headed for a fall. Another way to look at this real quick, by the way, is we did a, um, a, some research when everybody went to work from home. And what we found is that uh, out of 41,000 US-based organizations that 35% um, in the fi uh, finance sector, 63 in government, 84 in education, all shifted off network. So they went to work from home. And we found that 13% of companies um, have malware on their co corporate networks before the work from home. And then 45% have malware on their remote office net networks. So where I am today, where you guys are all presumably today, or most of you, which means that um, home office networks are now three times more likely to have at least one malware infection versus a corporate network. So that means that you're basically sticking your users out into a polluted network. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Another interesting thing is that um, we noticed that, um, that, well, actually, let me move ahead here because I'm running out of time. We also noticed that 25, almost a quarter percent of uh, residential IP addresses are exposing some service for the ISP to be able to manage their, their routers. And so what that means is that the users probably got, went on to their um, cable modems and then gave themselves access. You know how cable providers give you the admin uh, interface if you're smart enough to do things with it. Um, and 9.5% 9, 9 of those, or 9.5% overall, exposed their administrative interface to the internet which is super scary. So your employees are working from home and 10% of them, almost 10% of them, will actually have an administrative interface exposed to the internet and who knows what kind of credentials they use, right? Um, and we also found from another study that uh, the employees share their uh, password and allow their family members to use their corporate issued device. So all of that's pretty scary um, because if you think about it, um, you've got on the right hand side is your home network and it's not just a home network. It's got all kinds of stuff. It might have Nest or a, maybe a Roomba or some other back disk vacuum um, keys. Maybe your car is connected, connected light bulbs. You've got all kinds of things, kids playing games. So who knows what kind of pollution is in there? So the bad guys, instead of targeting the corporate network, will target, you know, your kids devices. They'll move laterally into your corporate devices. And then from there, it's usually an easy slide down the VPN tunnel into the corporate network. So that's where a lot of this risk comes in. So when I talk about that, don't just think about, hey, your, um, your corporate network needs to be patched against VPN and RDP and all that, and your users need to be trained. But also bear in mind that you need to do a little bit more now to uh, remotely administer your endpoints or at least monitor them. Uh, because you're basically sending people who aren't used to working from home into an environment that's pretty much polluted by, by kids and other and roommates and things like that. So, all right, so here's where I give you a quick sales pitch, um, which is from a BitSight perspective, if you are curious, you know, obviously talk to Atlantic, but um, what we do is, you know, I kind of give you a little bit of a feel for it, but is for looking at managing your vendors, looking at yourself, because a lot of organizations manage themselves by uh, implementing controls. But being able to have this sort of external presence can help you to find assets you didn't know existed, um, see where your controls are failing and you're not aware of it. 
Um, and you can use it for all kinds of things, benchmarking yourself against your competitors, your peers. Um, and in fact, we at 20% uh, of uh, nation states actually use us to monitor their own national security. 50% uh, of uh, cyber insurance policies are underwritten using uh, BitSight data. And many companies, a lot of private equity firms use us for merger and acquisitions um, to find out what the, as part of their due diligence, to find out what the security posture of their acquisitions are going to be. So there's a lot of things that are interesting. Um, and so BitSight and Atlantic Data Security, it's like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, folks. We might have fallen into each other, but it's delicious as a combination, and if not individually. So that's all I have for you. I almost made it in my allotted time. And now I wonder if any of y'all have any questions.